Russian political culture has four distinguishing characteristics. Statism, equality, skeptics, and East versus West mentality. Statism is the belief of the people that it is good for the government to be strong. A strong government and a powerful government can keep you safe, even if that leader has authoritarian or totalitarian tendencies, as long as they're keeping you safe and protected from foreign invasion, you are okay. Um, equality, the state takes care that all the people are provided for in times of need, particularly in Russia where they have a lack of a lot of arable land and there's a um, history of famines. The people of Russia want the state, and this kind of goes with statism too, um, wants the state's role to be making sure that everybody is fed and everybody has essential, basic essentials for life. Skeptics, um, this is where a lot of the irony in Russian political culture comes in, is that even though they value a strong and powerful state and they want the state to provide for their basic needs, a lot of the people in Russia are skeptical that the state is really has the people's best interest in mind. Um, they don't really trust that the state um, is not corrupt. So where they let the state take care of them, they believe that the people who run the country uh, are basically exploiting their power and their position. East versus West. Russia has uh, been conflicted, and you see this with like Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. Um, these were leaders that heard the ideas of the Enlightenment. They heard Voltaire, and they heard Locke, uh, and they wanted to try to adapt some of those European ideals to the Russian um, political culture, but there's always this major conflict of liberalizing and becoming more democrat, um, democratic like European countries, but also preserving Eastern traditions. So those themes really remain, remain strong throughout Russian political culture. All right, let's cover the social cleavages. Okay, the first one we're gonna talk about is nationality. Okay, this is their biggest cleavage. 80% of the people who live within Russia are actually Russian. Then you have other major ethnic minorities, but they're not going to be at the center of the state or the center of Russia or around Moscow. You're really going to find these people on the fringes. Okay, so you have Tatars, who are Muslims, Ukrainians, um, Bashkir, uh, Bashkirs, um, Kuvash and about 12% of really minor, other minor um, ethnic minorities. Now, Russia has an asymmetrical federalism, or federalism. And remember, that's when the national government plays favorites to other states. Because of the structure of their federation, ethnicity tends to coincide with region and religion too. So for example, Chechnya is on the outskirts of Russia. It's kind of like, here's the border of Russia right here, the Caucasus Mountains, Georgia. Okay. Um, the uh, rest of Russia is up, you know, all on to the north. Okay. The people in Chechnya, not only are they on the outskirts or in the southern like southern western region of russia southwest region of russia they are also a different ethnicity all right um this comes up and it's important to know the difference between um a ruski which is the russian word for somebody of russian ethnicity versus a rosinski which refers to people of various ethnic backgrounds. So these would be Yoruskis, <laughs> and then um, the Tatars and the Ukrainians and things like that. Those would be your Rosiskis. Okay, so um, Chechnya. Talk about Chechnya some more because they're really a big deal because of their push for independence. They've become a problem or a thorn in the side of Putin. 
Um, this is a Muslim region. Uh, in order to try to gain independence, what Chechnya has done is carried out acts of terrorism. Okay, the reason why Putin and um, Kremlin and the folks in Moscow are fearful of Chechnya and their terrorist attacks is that if we they allow if the Russian government allows Chechnya to break off and become independent, they're afraid that other independence movements will break out in the country and it would be like the domino effect if if Chechnya becomes independent other parts of Russia who you know in different regions who don't really align themselves to the Russian government they would break off too in an attempt to try to gain some legitimacy for the Russian government over the people in Chechnya uh, there was a referendum or a vote by the people uh, to have a new constitution for that region. So that in and of itself is kind of a, a sense of co-optation. Like try to make the people who are on the fringes or your, the people who are protesting and attacking kind of try to pull them in to the government's decision making. And also Putin being the charismatic authority that he is. Um, he took to the airwaves in support of the referendum, um, encouraging people to approve the referendum. And if they approve the referendum, um, Putin told the, the people of Chechnya, sorry, the people of Chechnya would have a little bit more freedom and more control over its affairs. So as long as you stayed with Russia, uh, Putin guaranteed that the Chechnyans would be able to make some political decisions of their own. Okay, so again, this is total attempt at co-optation here. Um, so, I mean, look, Putin took to the airwaves in support of the referendum, telling the people if they approved the referendum, so sorry about that, telling the people if they approved the referendum, the Chechnyans' war-ravaged homeland would be given some extra independence. Here's a map of the different ethnic groups that you will find spread out. Of course, Russians, um, it's going to be in the darker red right here. And then again, on the outskirts or on the fringes of Russia, you're going to find more ethnic minorities. Okay, religion. Most Russians um, are going to identify themselves as Russian Orthodox, but most of the people who live in Russia, a majority of the people are actually um, not religious at all because the Soviet Union, part of communism was that you couldn't really practice religion. So you lost your religious affiliation throughout the 20th century in Russia. There are other religions that are represented in small percentages in various places and parts of Russia. So you will find Muslims, Catholics, Protestants, and Jewish uh, people. You do see more, um, the population of Muslims are increasing, and part of that is because you have migrant workers, people from the Middle East or um, the former Soviet republics that are moving into uh, Moscow as uh, migrant workers. Um, okay, and that the area that separates Russia from the Middle East is the Caucasus Mountains. So hold on, I'm going to go back to this map. Okay, so you have the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea right here. Okay, you have Caucasus Mountains, um, and right over here because this is a tilted view of Russia, right? <clears throat> So the Middle East, you know, people are moving in from the Middle East and migrating from the Middle East into Russia. And when they come in, they're bringing their um, Islamic religion. Okay, And the Caucasus Mountains is also where you would find the Chechnyans. So that very unstable region where you have the Muslims who are fighting for independence, um, they are, you are going to um, find a heavier concentration of Muslim people in that area. Uh, now, in preparation for the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi, uh, people did arrest 
or the Russian police arrested 300 Muslims in Moscow. Um, they were afraid that they were going to cause uh, disruptions in the Olympic Games or be contributing to terrorist attacks. Other social cleavages. Um, you have social class. You have poor versus the wealthy. Um, in the USSR, a lot of the Communist Party members, the elites, um, were well off, and that kind of translates today. Um, so if you remember the presentations on how communism or the Communist Party was set up, uh, there was this thing called nomenclatura, and nomenclatura was a pyramid of elites, like people who knew people or knew the right people would get in the higher levels of government. That translates into social class divisions today. Um, so you still do have a small class of really rich people that were the oligarchs of the Communist Party, the elites of the Communist Party, and then you have the working um, class of people. Most of the people in Russia live in cities, and most of them are going to live in cities near Moscow or on the, toward the European side of Russia. Um, the people that live in the cities are going to be well-educated, university-educated, and hold a lot of those Western values. Okay, the East versus the West mentality. Um, again, there is this tradition of charismatic authorities and statism where people have put a lot of power in the hands of individuals who they believe could take care of them. So there's been a lot of highly centralized leadership, yet they don't trust them. So the Russian people give these people like, you know, they give these people a lot of power, but then they don't trust that these people are using their power appropriately. Um, statism and collectivist tendencies. The state, again, will take an active role in your life. And there is this idea that the state will collect, collect like a welfare state, the state will collect taxes, the state will collect resources and then the state will distribute those resources equally so there is a large distrust in those who get um get ahead um meaning like if your neighbor becomes wealthy or your neighbor works hard and earns a lot of money you're not going to trust that necessarily or you don't trust that kind of sense of political or economic opportunity okay again desire for order and stability this Go along, it goes along with statism, even at the expense of personal freedom. Okay, um, uh, we'll get to that. All right, political culture. <clears throat> I like that. Well, you can look at one of the group's um, exhibits in the library. They did a lot of Putin um, memes. So... Their political culture really uh, is about the difference between being a Slavophile, which means like Eastern traditions, versus a Westerner, which means being more like European. Um, Slavophiles, really, it's that sense of uh, statism, that sense of having a strong military, that sense of charismatic authority and having somebody take care of you when you can't take care of yourself. Um, the Westerners tend to be reformers. They want to, they're more liberal as far as international liberal. They push for more democracy. Um, Putin supporters tend to be Slavophiles or Westerners. Yeah, Slavophiles. Because, again, you have one man, uh, charismatic authority. Look at those biceps. Those biceps take care of everything. Okay. Um, here's the breakdown of support. So you have... Um, the different political parties, you have, um, 88 members, ah, 88 members um, are Westerners, but 210 members are Slav, uh, Slavophiles.
All right, and we'll talk about this.